in these 11 chapters, I'm walking you through a methodology of gut healing. This book is not just for people who suffer with health issues. If you are healthy, you need this book because your gut is so essential to your long-term health that you should be nurturing it literally right now. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. So today, Dotsie and I have back a terrific guest with whom we spoke a couple years ago. And we talk really honestly about a topic that people often don't even discuss with their doctors, which is going to the bathroom. And we took questions from our audience and we didn't even get to all of them because the conversation was so full of information um, with each question. But the thing that I was most intrigued by and learned a lot about was constipation. I had always thought that it was just dealt with like, get more fiber, drink more water, exercise more often. Um, But it was really much more than that. And Dr. B talks about things that I had, I didn't, had no idea contributed to constipation, which have nothing to do with fiber, water, or exercise. So anyway, Dotsie, before I give too much of our conversation away, please introduce our guest today. All right, folks, our guest today is Will Bolshewitz, also known as Dr. B. He's a gastroenterologist who is also the author of the books Fiber Fueled and the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. He lost more than 45 pounds when he switched to a plant-based diet and now has his own patients take control of their health and reverse their own digestive problems by following his fiber-fueled prescriptions. Dr. B went to medical school at Georgetown School of Medicine, got a Master of Science in Clinical Investigation from Northwestern, and now works at a gastroenterology clinic in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. We first talked to Dr. B in March of 2020. Y'all know what was happening then when he was about to release his first book, Fiber Fueled, the plant-based gut health program for losing weight, restoring your health, and optimizing your microbiome. At the time, he was pretty nervous about how well it would do in a pandemic. Well, guess what? It very quickly became a New York Times, USA Today, and Publishers Weekly bestseller. And now he is the superstar in our vegan community. He believes that all health starts right in the gut. And we are excited to have him back today. Y'all might remember him from episode 74, like I said, back in March 2020. So press press replay on that one too. Welcome, Dr. B, again to the Switch for Good pod. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm honored to be here. And um, it's crazy how much things can, can change in such a short period of time. It was just two years ago. We were actually recording, you know, right at the very beginning of the pandemic, the first time we got together. So it was crazy. And, um, yeah. you know, actually, one of the things that happened recently, I don't even know if you realize this, Dotsy, is that I actually just left my medical practice just in the last few weeks. Oh, so oh, to, wow. to, to, to be a full time author. Uh, what? I know you're a regular on the exam room podcast. So are you going to the podcast realm? I'm, I'm going to be full time in the exam room with Chuck Carroll. That's all I'm going to do. No, wow. I'm just oh, I'm no. just <laughs> I was I like, love, I don't know. <laughs> I because I love your shows with Chuck. I love I, it. One of them made no. me laugh so hard. I wrote to Chuck going, that episode was amazing. <laughs> I can probably tell you which one it was. I think I got a feeling. So um 
for people who are at home who aren't familiar, I go on the exam room podcast with Chuck Carroll once a month. And um, the probably the biggest response we ever got was to an episode where we talked the entire time about poop, the entire yes. time. Yeah. Yes. So it was awesome. And we're we have questions for you in that area too. Well, I'm glad we're going to talk about it because this is this is like what I feel the most comfortable talking about of all topics. <laughs> so um, I put this above even fiber in terms of my preference of what we'll discuss. But anyway, to answer the question, uh, you know, what am I up to? I'm stepping into a very prominent role with a personalized nutrition company called Zoe. And Zoe is, we could talk more about it if you want to. Um, that's not what I'm here for, but I'm, I am now the U.S. medical director of Zoe. and they're not a vegan nutrition company, but the bottom line is that almost, almost 100% of people who use the Zoe program will be increasing the plants in their diet dramatically. And in this mission for me to try to improve people's health, I know that in order to move the needle, it's not that we can take you know a situation where 1% are vegan and suddenly make that 100%. I want to. But on that path, what we, what we need are a whole lot of people that are primarily and predominantly plant-based and they're close and maybe not all the way there. And mm -hmm. I celebrate that. So tell us about this new book that you have out, Fiber Shield, which uh, the cookbook, which is a companion to your first book. Yep. So it's coming out May 17th in the US, May 19th in the UK. And um I think that to properly understand the Fiber Fields cookbook, we actually have to just go all the way back to Fiber Field. So Fiber Fields came out in May of 2020, uh, instant New York Times bestseller, 200,000 copies have been sold. That's crazy. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. I wouldn't have shocked me if there were, you know, 900 copies sold and 700 of them were my mom. So, um, and the goal with Fiber Field was from my perspective, I wanted to show people this revolution that is actively taking place right now in the world. It's just not right under your nose because it's happening in science. I wanted to show them that and blow their minds and then use that to orient them towards better health and ultimately to motivate them to make choices that are good for their gut microbiome, which basically means eating a wide variety of plants. So that's what... That's what Fiber Field was. Now, looking at what happened in my life during the two years since Fiber Field came out, a ton of attention, which is nice. I'm, I'm flattered. Um, it's also quite overwhelming. I am one human being. I'm actually human. Uh, and I poop like everyone else. So let me just come clean on that. And so with all this attention, people are reaching out to me and they're saying, you know, either they're in my clinic saying this to me or they're reaching out to me through social media saying, Dr. B, look, you got me. I'm motivated. I want to eat the fiber fueled way. But I have to be honest with you. I'm not feeling good when I try to do this. And I think that there has to be like, there has to be honesty with what we're doing here, where if people are struggling to actually accomplish what we're asking them to do, we have to first acknowledge that that exists. And then we have to create solutions for them to overcome those challenges. And that became the genesis of the Fiber Fueled cookbook. The Fiber Fueled is the why. And now let me show you how. Mm. And so there's a hundred, so just to kind of describe it, because it's a little bit of a weird book, I'll just come clean on that. Um, to call it the Fiber Fueled cookbook is actually almost a misnomer. Because yes, it is a cookbook. It has 125 recipes. There are some people wonder, is it the same recipes from the first book? No, it's not. 125 recipes, full color photography, as you would find in any other cookbook. But what happened here is that I could have honestly taken a shortcut and just been done right there. And I would have written a couple of paragraphs and then I would have just turned over the recipes and you guys could have at it but I saw an opportunity to use this as a healing tool. Yeah. And so what you find is that there are actually 11 chapters. You don't even get to the first recipe until the back end of chapter four. And in these 11 chapters, I'm walking you through a methodology of gut healing. This book is not just for people who suffer with health issues. If you are healthy, you need this book because 
your gut is so essential to your long-term health that you should be nurturing it literally right now. But if you suffer with digestive health issues, if you think that there's a gut health problem, I'm going to show you how to actually fix that. More specifically, if you have food intolerances, which many people do, and you are struggling to eat these foods that we are celebrating here on this podcast, I need to give you a way to overcome that. And I don't know who else is going to do this other than me, because I'm a gastroenterologist. This is what I've spent my career doing. Mm -hmm. So it's my responsibility to step up and figure this out. That's what the Fiber Fields Cookbook is. It also teaches you how to sprout, how to ferment food, how to make sourdough bread. There's actually two recipe-based protocols for food intolerances, one that's low FODMAP, one that's low in histamine. And the point of all of it is basically just whoever you are, I hope that you're motivated to take care of your gut. Let me now provide you with the tools and you can apply this to your own life in whatever way makes the most sense and brings you the most joy. Yeah. <clears throat> my, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting my mom this book. My mom is... Uh... 74 and she's pretty much vegan you know like she doesn't like to piss off her friends if they make like a nice brownies and bring them over but she's 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 good she's she's a i'd say 98 percent vegan uh she does not eat a wide variety though that that's for sure she started having severe severe gut pain without going into all the gnarly details, we're, we're going we're to be talking about the gnarly details as we go along, but just, you know, also to save her privacy. <laughs> like, uh, And she went to her doctor and he said, food has nothing to do with your gut. Now, if I didn't know you or know any of this stuff, I still feel like that just wouldn't make any sense. Like that's where the food goes and that's where it sits. That's where it assimilates and that's where it's digests. Like for it to have nothing to do with your gut is like, that's just like, hold on a second. Let's dive in there. He puts her on uh budasonide. I'm probably saying that wrong. Is that right? right. That's nice. yep. That's okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Like three milligrams a day and it's a six week course. Uh, and then we're going to see what happens. So, you know, it's, we've certainly asked different doctors, not gastroenterologists, but different doctors on this podcast, like, what is the holdup for the rest of the doctors to just be keeping up with the times? It seems to me like that's their job, right? You go to medical school, but like, you got to keep up with the literature and the data to actually be serving your patients who you yeah. went into school to, to help. Many doctors will say that. What is the hang up? The problem is that there is no education throughout the system. All right. So I did four years of medical school. Like consider this for those of you who know me, if you're watching me on video right now, you can see how young I am. I'm in my early forties. And I, my, the last time that I had formal training in nutrition was 2003. So that was almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was for two weeks. And that wasn't like, Hey, let's teach these kids how to uh, talk to patients about, you know, diet and dietary choices. This was okay, cool. Uh, what are the, what are the symptoms of a vitamin B6 deficiency? There's six of them. What are they? That's, that's completely ridiculous. I've never even diagnosed a B6 deficiency in my entire career. So it's missing in medical education. It's not a part of medical school. It's not a part of residency or fellowship training that comes after that. Doctors are not compensated. This is by the way, I think it's important before I even go here into the money that it does piss me off when people are pretending that doctors are only motivated by money. I don't actually believe that's true at all. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've worked in the healthcare system for so many years, have a bazillion friends who are doctors. I don't think that's actually true. If that were true, we would go into banking. While I was working, you know, 80 hours a week, I was watching my friends from college who went into banking. They literally were making seven figures. So the problem is that we are well-intentioned, we go into healthcare and the system breaks us. Mm. It is hard. Burnout rates are at an all-time high among medical doctors. People are desperately hoping and trying to get out of healthcare because of the way that they're being treated. Mm. And when you're getting beat down by the system, the system says, the system says, Dotsy, you're a primary care doctor. Um, Sorry, uh, we're cutting what we're paying you. 
So now I realize that your employees need a raise. I realize that rent has gone up. It's very expensive in your community. And I realize that your medical supplies are getting more expensive by the year. But actually, we're cutting what we're paying you as an insurance provider because um, we can. And there's nothing you can do about it. So now here are your choices. You can close, you can close your doors and retire. Um, or you can reduce the amount of time that you spend with your patients and see more people and depersonalize healthcare even more. And you may care about your patients, but we're not giving you a choice. These, these are the choices that you have to make. That's what's happening. Hmm. That's, that's what's happening. Now, there are some people, a very, very small percentage of doctors who have busted out and create like, you know, for example, boutique practices, functional medicine practices. And I don't know that that's really a solution because only rich people can afford that. Yeah. So we have to fix the system. And I, I, I don't want to spend the entire time uh, on like healthcare system issues, but the system is very broken. And it just, break, it, 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 it pains me and it breaks my heart to hear a doctor say something like this. Yeah, it's sense. not true. It doesn't make sense. I'm sure that doctor works their tail off. They care a lot about their patients. They're poorly educated. They're, they're beat down by the system. And frankly, to have a conversation, once you say, yes, nutrition matters, you have now committed to the 10 extra minutes that it requires to even touch the surface of that topic. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that means you're now an extra patient behind. Part of what I'm saying here is that the paternalistic view of healthcare needs to go away. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to become empowered individuals, learn what we need so that we can challenge. Because frankly, if a doctor says that to you, you need a new doctor. And so you need to be empowered enough to make that realization that it's time to pivot and move in a new direction. So we're going to answer questions from our Facebook group that who have questions for you, uh, Dr. B, for a little while. Is that all right? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, okay. So I'm going to start with a leaky gut question from Sebastian. We talk a lot about leaky gut on this program. I know you do too. And he says... He has MS and cutting dairy from my diet seems to be the most impactful way to get rid of my symptoms. I've not had numb fingers and numb far forearms since I ditched it. Can you explain in more detail how dairy is linked to leaky gut and how leaky gut can cause many problems in our body, including progression of autoimmune diseases? Because I think a lot of people don't understand what that means, leaky gut. Yeah, so taking it from the top on leaky gut, um... First of all, the, the term that I would use, so Sebastian, this is a great question, and I'm glad that you're feeling better and that making this dietary choice made a huge difference in your life. That's like exactly where you should be. So that's fantastic. Uh, leaky gut I, I, is, is a term that is appropriate, but you just have to be very careful because if you type leaky gut into Google, 95% of what you're going to read is not actually going to be scientifically accurate. So I prefer the term dysbiosis because I've never seen the misinformation campaigns surround dysbiosis. That's always just doctors who are super nerdy like me using this term. And so dysbiosis or leaky gut is where basically the gut, the, the gut and the gut microbiome are out of balance. So at baseline, the way that it's supposed to work is that you have this very large community of literally hundreds of different species, if not a thousand species of microbes living in harmony and in balance, supporting one another. And when things are not working the way that they're supposed to, this falls out of balance. And this creates a problem because we rely on these microbes to perform certain jobs, certain duties, including in the case of Sebastian, priming and optimizing the immune system. So when we uh, fall out of balance, this word dysbiosis, if you were to zoom in on the gut, what you would see is that there's less good guys, there are more bad guys, and that there has been injury to the lining of the intestine. We call this the epithelial layer. The epithelial layer is a single layer of cells. It's so thin that the naked eye is incapable of seeing it. But on one side of it is your entire gut microbiome, 38 trillion microbes. And on the other side is 70% of your immune system. Mm. And so this, um, this barrier, you can think of it like the wall of a castle. 
And when it's intact, it's stopping the bad stuff from getting in. But when the castle is under attack and the army that you have defending it is not enough to hold up, holes start getting punched into the lining of the castle. And now we are basically what used to be a protective mechanism is now like allowing stuff to flow through freely. And this is effectively what leaky gut is. The immune system can get confused because the immune system is literally right there. So these toxins, we call it bacterial endotoxin that start to flow across this barrier. They're going to come into contact immediately with 70% of your immune system. And this is how we get issues like, for example, multiple sclerosis, MS. So how do we explain elimination of dairy and how that improves a person's gut microbiome? Well, part of the issue here is th there's a number of things that are possible. First of all, we know that one of the most common food allergies is in fact dairy and that an allergy is activation of the immune system. So that's part of it. But the other part that's probably more common is the high saturated fat within dairy. We have, we know we have seen repeatedly in studies causes injury to the gut microbiome and actually does induce dysbiosis. Mm. Nutrition is all about substitutions. What are you replacing with what? You can make almost anything look better or worse, depending on what you're comparing it to. Butter can actually look good if you compare it to trans fat. It's a joke. That's not healthy food. But that's what they will do in studies to make butter look good. Mm -hmm. When it comes to dairy, if we lose the dairy and we replace it with plants, we are making a healthy substitution. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the absence of dairy. I mean, that is important. But it's the absence of dairy in combination with leveling up your nutrition by adding in more plants. And when you do this, you are basically creating a formula that moves you closer to health and may give your gut what it needs to actually get the immune system reoriented. And then the swelling in your hands and the discomfort that you have in your extremities, you notice that it goes away and it improves. I was thinking about uh, if, if there's foods that, you know, kind of plug us up because we promised we would get into deep poop talks. Uh, and uh, Deborah asks a question that is very similar to uh, what my mom's going through in terms of uh, a lot of bloat and, and, and gas. So Deborah says she does, she wants to know if, if following a low FODMAP diet really works for vegans to cure bloat. If you take Linzess, which says she says she does, does it cause bloat? She said she's definitely read that it's a side effect, but she takes it because she doesn't poop without it. So that seems like a double-edged sword. Um, uh, and she has, a, you know, I have bloating and distensions, almost, distension almost all of the time now. Right. Yeah, so this is, it's a bit of a... Um complex topic, but I, I'm going to try my best yeah. to keep it high level so that everyone who's listening and not just the, the specific person, uh, what was her name again, Dotsie? I'm sorry. Debra. Debra. So, you know, obviously I would love to do whatever I can to help out Debra, but this is also a complex topic. Let me try to walk through some of the things that are standing out here from my perspective as a GI doctor. Okay. So first of all, um, gas and bloating. The number one cause of gas and bloating is constipation. Yeah. There are tons oh. of people who are constipated yeah. and they don't yeah. realize it. And the reason why is because we have made the mistake of believing that constipation is just determined by your frequency, like how often you go. Mm -hmm. That's not true. If you go once every seven days, you are constipated. There is no doubt about it. <laughs> but when you go once a day, or even five times a day, and you have a ton of gas and bloating, distension, possibly abdominal pain, you notice that you're losing your appetite, maybe even feel a little queasy, like kind of nauseous, um, and a lot of fatigue. That person is a con that they sound constipated to me. Mm -hmm. And the definition of constipation, just so that everyone kind of understands where I'm coming from, is actually not designed or defined by the frequency, but instead is, are you inadequately emptying your bowels? 
-hmm. and as a result, suffering symptoms. So inadequate could be that you're not going often enough, but it could also be that you're not completely emptying. So to me, one of the absolutely critical questions that I will ask that's a game changer is, do you feel like you completely empty your bowels when you go? And if the answer is no, and you suffer with gas and bloating, there's a very real possibility that this is actually the source of your issue, even if you're pooping five times a day. And so um, with this particular person, uh, Deborah, mm -hmm. she is taking Linz S. Um, there are definitely some people who do need medications like Linz S, but this is uh, a very strong- It's a laxative. A very strong medication. It's a laxative, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's by prescription only. And, you know, I'm not one to dismiss all medications at face value. I think that they're, you know, the best healthcare to me is when we combine diet and lifestyle, optimize that, do that first. But then when necessary, we step into the healthcare system and we use the tools that we've created there. So now the issue though, is Linz S is a very powerful, um, uh, treatment for constipation, like extremely powerful. If you are not going despite Linz S, as a gastroenterologist, this is a red flag. And it raises a question as to what's going on with your body. So let me propose this. This is, I'm hoping that this is going to help not only Deborah, but actually mm -hmm. many more people who are out there. Well, this she is says she takes you know, it because she doesn't poop without it. So she is taking it. Yeah. So it but she like still she's has bloating and distension all the time. So maybe she's not emptying. She's probably still not adequately mobilizing her bowels. Uh huh. Okay. Because from my perspective as a GI doctor, when a person who's constipated, once I've made that diagnosis, when they are completely moving their bowels, then the bloating and the gas go away. Mm -hmm. That's how I know that they're adequately treated. Prior to that, even if they say I'm pooping way better, are you bloated? Yes. Okay. We still have work to do. Now, uh, this is where it gets, I think, a little bit interesting. And I sincerely hope that this helps way beyond Deborah. I hope this helps a lot of people. There are many forms of constipation. It's not just that we're not moving our bowels. Like it's not just a sluggish gut. There are uh, parts of the pelvic floor that can actually cause us to become constipated. And when that is the case, the treatments that we're applying, including things like Linz S, they will like not work very effectively. They may not work at all, to be honest. The fact that the Linz S that she requires it does not rule out these things that I'm about to talk about. I'm gonna talk about two things real quick. Um, I'm sure you guys don't necessarily wanna talk about constipation the whole time, but it is an important topic. Yeah. So first of all, uh, and, and important to the point that in my book, in the, the Fiber Fields Cookbook, actually, this is an area of focus. And many of the things that we're discussing right now, most people probably haven't heard before, but that you would get knowledge like this from the Fiber Fields Cookbook um, right off the bat in chapter two. So, all right, there is a condition called pelvic dysinertia. It is almost exclusively women. Our pelvic floor muscles, there are many of them. It's not just the anus. It's the one that most of us know. But And these muscles, they're intended to work in synchrony to allow us to have a healthy bowel movement. Um, I'm going to try to speak and simultaneously use my hands so that anyone who can see this can actually visualize what I'm describing, but I'm going to try to describe it at the same time. I feel like a food network host. Okay. Like. <laughs> <laughs> the folks can go to our YouTube channel if they want to actually watch the demonstration. <laughs> there we go. So it's, it's like, you know, it's like, how do we properly describe the food, you know, so the people who just hear it there anyway. So here we go. When a person has a bowel movement, this, uh, uh, there's the anal canal and there's the rectum and the way that it's supposed to work is that up in the rectum, that's the last part of your colon, there's actually a pinch. The muscles will come together and that pinch will move like a wave, all right? And it will slowly advance. And what it's doing, because it's 
coming together and it's slowly advancing is if you can imagine this, not to, not to be too graphic, but you know, look, I am who I am. We're basically pushing the poop along. Yeah. And simultaneously what happens is that the anal canal and the pelvic floor will relax and open. And we are creating a pathway for a good, healthy bowel movement. So when this happens in a normal person, this is a normal, healthy bowel movement. You get that pinch, you get that push, and you get that relaxation of the pelvic floor and out comes this glorious, glorious bowel movement that like has you walking out of the bathroom with a strut and people are like, yo, what happened? To, what happened with that person? They had a good one. So, all right. Now that's healthy. Let's talk about unhealthy. Unhealthy, and this is predominantly women, not exclusively, but predominantly women. I suspect, this is just speculation, but I suspect that it is connected to childbirth in many cases, not all. Um, it does tend to be more common as people age, but I've, I've seen plenty of people that are teenagers and also 20s um, that have this issue. Pelvic dyssynergia, here's what happens. You get that pinch, and you get that push, you're pushing, this is you, you know, sort of trying to have a bowel movement. And so the poop is being propelled, but here's the problem. The anal canal and the pelvic floor, they're not letting up. Mm -hmm. They're not clearing a path. In fact, if anything, in some, in, in many cases, they will paradoxically clamp down and get tighter. Mm -hmm. Your poop has run into a brick wall. And what many people will do in this circumstance is they will push, bear down, mm -hmm. right in the face. Yeah. And that's to build up the pressure within this pocket, right here in this pocket, to get overcome the resistance that exists at your bottom. So you push, 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 and you ramp it up. And then it's a quick little open and snap shut. And all that comes out is a nugget and you call it a bowel movement. I had a bowel movement today, mm -hmm. but you didn't empty. Yeah, so what do you that. say to people to how the, how can we relax that area that most of us can't even visualize? It's hard. We don't even, we didn't even know it existed. Well, so one of the things that I talk about in the fiber fields cookbook is I walk people through a strategy. I actually have an acronym that teaches people the strategy of how to heal their gut. G-R-O-W-T-H, growth. Now, anyone who really knows me knows in my community, this is a very important word for us. But in this case, this is my strategy to heal. And the first letter G stands for Genesis. What is the root of your problem? We can't properly treat you until we know what we're even treating. Now we can talk about the other letters later. They have to do in part with how to understand food and overcome food intolerances. Um, we can talk about those letters if you guys want to later, but it all starts with understanding the root of the problem. And that means that we need to properly diagnose this because if you're just, if it's just, look, there's only one form of constipation. So here's the pill. Well, then you're never going to understand that there's this other thing that exists, right. pelvic dyssynergia. Yeah. How do we diagnose it? Many times I can almost tell in the clinic talking to the patient because they say, look, my poop is soft, but I still am straining like crazy to have the smallest little thing. All right, that is probably someone with pelvic dyssynergia, but there are some people who are a surprise. You can't just predict it based upon what they say. So we have a test. It's called anorectal manometry. And <laughs> that um, sounds fun. Basically, yeah, <laughs> well- <laughs> I mean, look, <laughs> I, at the end of the day, if, if on the other side of this, you actually feel well, yeah, it's still worth it, right? <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this test would allow you to make the diagnosis. Now to, to answer the question, like, what do we do? Okay. We can start with the basics. You can start with these basics literally right now. You don't have to do this test if you don't want to. You can start by elevating your feet. They have these things called squatty potty, but you don't need to buy the squatty potty. Just like literally take a box or a stool, put it under your feet and make it so that your knees are actually above your hips. This is a proper pooping position. When you go to poop, lean forward 
and put your elbows on your knees. I would actually recreate this in front of you guys, but it would be, <laughs> we'll just leave that alone for another time. But you lean forward and you put your elbows on your knees. All right. So your knees are above your hips. You lean forward. It's kind of like the thinking man. I think you should have and that as your photos on your, on your books, that position, you in that position in all your books. <laughs> get ready. Author, Wilbur, Dr. Will Smith. The the, thinking their man. third book is get ready to poop. And you're like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing a bestseller already. So. <laughs> totally. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's something that could be done, right? Is to actually get our pelvic floor into proper alignment because when we're sitting upright on a potty, we're not actually in proper alignment. That's not the way that we were designed to poop. Mm -hmm. So, but if a person wants to fix this issue, pelvic dysinertia, once you make the diagnosis, the value of the test is let's be, let's have clarity. Let's not, mm -hmm. let's not speculate. Let's actually have clarity. And once you have clarity, then you can charge in that direction because you know, you're doing what's right. And so then what you do is you get um, the person set up with what's called a pelvic therapist. Effect effectively, they are a physical therapist that specializes in pelvic floor problems. They're almost all, I've never actually met a male pelvic therapist in my entire career. I, I, as far as I know, they're always women because I think this is who would be attracted to trying to help because mostly they're dealing with women. And it's not only constipation, it's also incontinence, incontinence of bowel, incontinence of bladder, could be pain during intercourse. There's a number of different issues. There are occasionally men who do need to go to the pelvic therapist, but most of the time it's women. And so anyway, they can help with these types of things. I've actually been to a pelvic therapist because I had dyspareunia, which is pain during intercourse, which caused me to clamp down. Oh. And it was a very, you lie on the table and this young woman put her, her arm into me, into my vagina and moves it around to kind of try and relax you. And I would weep for the beginning, the first few mm. um, sessions because it felt so humiliating. But I mean, in the end, she helped me. I don't have dyspareunia anymore and I don't. So I think, but she was very kind. And, but it, it, it is a, it's an important, I think it's an important thing for people. A lot of doctors, by the way, didn't tell me to do it. It took me a long time to even that concept is not well known in the medical community, it seems. Mm -hmm. That's super frustrating. Again, yeah. not to come back to that topic again. Yeah, but, yeah, right, um, right, right. So anyway, okay. Yeah. So, uh, a, a, a pelvic somebody who will what would you call them? Pelvic floor therapist. Yeah, pelvic floor therapist is yeah. is okay. the treatment, and that's so that's where you would typically go. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in thinking about Deborah, but then also, of course, my mom's in the back of my mind the whole time you were describing this, and she could have that, she could not. Um, but I'd love to talk about. It seems in um, just with our with our human bodies and probably all mammals' bodies that sometimes there's an issue going on that seems completely and entirely unrelated to to something else that's happening in your life. And um, constipation that's definitely that's definitely my mom. Um, but when you were talking about the clamping down, and you were talking about the inability to then relax right? Whether it's pelvic dyspnea or, or something else, I'm wondering about stress and the gut and stress and not being constipated. Uh, my mom's a high stress woman. She's definitely from that generation where you, you know, your job is to worry. Um, and how stress affects the gut, but most importantly, going to the bathroom and yeah. how much that is, is playing a role in, in people's frustrations around that potentially. Yeah. No, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you're touching on this because this is a very super important topic. And um, going back to the growth strategy, G-R-O-W-T-H, I just want to run through super quick what these are because I'm starting to feel yes. like we're going to be bouncing around a little bit and I don't want people to, I, I want people to kind of see the full picture and then we're going to zoom in. Awesome. So we talked, G, G is for Genesis, R-O-W, I put these three letters together because this is the approach that you take to identifying what causes your food intolerances. You can't do a blood test for this. There's no, there's no test that's reliable. The gold standard is this. Restrict, observe, work it back in. When you follow that sequence, withdraw, see how you feel, add it back in, see how you feel. When you follow that sequence, you can actually identify what foods are causing trouble for you. So T stands for train your gut. 
once you're empowered with the knowledge and understanding of what specifically foods, like what's, what foods cause trouble for you, mm -hmm. then you have the ability to actually overcome those uh, challenges and restore your gut to health where foods that you don't think you're capable of eating, or at least you think that you're only allowed to eat so much of it, it's actually fully, you're fully capable of consuming those foods without restriction. You just need to properly train your gut. You know, let me, let me like make a quick analogy that I think will hit home for you guys. Did you wake up as a great, like, did, were you born to compete in the Olympics and be a great athlete? Or is this something that you had to work on? I realize that the answer is so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. The second. <laughs> yeah. So like marathon runners, they don't just wake up and run a marathon, right? You don't sure. like, yeah. you, you need to actually build towards this. You have, you have to properly challenge your body and you do small incremental challenges. And that's what learning is. Yeah. And your gut is learning. It is learning yeah. right now. And it can be whatever you can teach it, whatever you want it to learn. But the way that you do that is actually by challenging it. You can't withdraw from it. You can't run away from it. That would be effectively the equivalent of saying, mm. I want to be a runner, but rather than running, I'm going to just sit on the couch. So when you say train though, is that, I, I've heard you talk about how we need to train our body to know when to get regular by sitting on the toilet for five minutes a day. Is that what you mean by training? Well, so you, training, training your gut, in this case, what I'm referring to is training your gut microbiome to tolerate all foods. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Making, okay, it it. So, making it so that you are able to basically eat without restriction and have no limitations. Now, you can train your gut to poop on a regular basis. I think I appreciate you for um, bringing this up where like for a person who's constipated, they can sit on the toilet for five minutes every day in the morning and actually train their body to poop at that time. But within this acronym, the growth strategy, training your gut really is intended to be about overcoming food intolerances by slowly increasing the amount of food that you eat of those foods that, that, that you struggle with. So anyway, the last letter, which is where I wanted to ultimately get to is H, holistic healing. Holistic, okay. Which is to say that your gut does not function in isolation. And it is not like simply proteins, carbs, and fats coming into contact with enzymes. When a person is stressed, like I think we've all been there, you have acute stress, you're freaking out, and then what happens? Most of us, the answer is going to be some sort of digestive symptom. Gas, bloating, pain, diarrhea, constipation. It's going to be one of those for most of us. Or we at least feel it in our stomach, like butterflies or clenching or something, even in the totally. moment of stress. Yeah. But on, and, and there are some who get migraine headaches, right? There's actually a physiologic basis for what I'm describing. If you were to go inside your body, what you would find is that in that moment of stress, your brain, the pituitary gland, releases a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH. And this CRH initiates a cascade of stress events in your body that if you follow this waterfall down, at the end of it, you will discover that it has injured your gut microbiome. Now, this is fine for occasional stress. That's not an issue that actually has its advantages. That's why we, we evolved to have it. But this is problematic when there is perpetual 24 seven activation of the stress response because of something that's happening in our life. And one of the things that I've observed is that I've seen, so my, my, my medical practice in the last few years was basically filled with people who failed with other doctors mm -hmm. and they come to me almost like look I, I don't have hope but i want to give it a chance with you and many times these people are doing everything right eating the right food sleeping exercising like 
I can't hand them a copy of fiber field and expect them to get better. That's not going to happen. They're already eating the fiber field away. What's the problem? It's not these things. It gets back to understanding the root of the problem. We go full circle all the way back to Genesis to say that there may be something in your life that's negatively affecting you and holding you back. And if we can create a plan to address that specifically, we can actually fully heal you. Mm-hmm. Quick little story. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, actually, one of the last uh, clinic visits that I had with a patient, I it was someone that I had been seeing for two years. She has ulcerative colitis. So this is an autoimmune disease. Uh, the immune system is actually attacking her intestines. And mm. this is a young woman. Um, she's single. She wants to date. She's not comfortable with dating because of the 24 hour a day diarrhea that she has. She mm. wakes up at night to go. Mm. I had been trying everything within my power to help her for more than a year. Of course, I told her to eat a more, more variety of plants. Of course, like I did, you know, more sleep, more exercise. It's not working. She comes to my office. I walk into the room and I look at her and I instantly see that she's different. She's got a smile on her face and um, she looks very calm and at ease, not anxious. I sit down and I ask her, what's going on? She says, you're not going to believe this, Dr. B, but I actually am all the way back. And I was jumping with joy on the inside, but I had to ask, what was it? Because I have been dropping the ball for two years. What was it? And she says, you know, I never told you this, but I have been terrified of my job for the past few years. Oh. Every single day when I would get into the car, I hated it. I would go in and my boss would publicly demean me in front of my peers. And it made me feel less than human. And I finally had the courage to walk away. And I found a new job and they treat me with respect. And here's this person in front of me and her ulcerative colitis is in remission. She didn't change her diet at all. Wow. That's such a good lesson for all of us to keep digging. If it's not working with yeah. all the prescriptions, it's, this, it's something else. Um, this person asks about fiber. How much fiber do we need? And then also, if you could touch on um, your, that sometimes just if you're constipated, just eating more fiber isn't the answer. First, you, you give them, you do the medical route and then they, have, they continue their lifestyle. So can you talk a little bit about those two things? Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll start moving a little rapid fire here to try to, so we can muscle through uh, the last couple of questions pretty efficiently. Um, so fiber, how much do we need? The recommendation is for women, 25 grams and for men, 38 grams. I say, stop counting grams of fiber, start counting plants. If you actually make this a focus within your life, if you're not doing this already, and you start increasing the varieties of plants in your diet, then you will naturally consume far more than the recommended amount of fiber. And that is a beautiful and exciting thing because if I walk out in the street right now and I find a random sample of 20 Americans, 19 out of 20 people are not even consuming the minimal recommended amount of fiber. So we have a lot of work to do, but it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to count grams of fiber. Just count your plants, eat more varieties. Now, when a person is constipated, we all hear increase your fiber. It's actually more nuanced than that. We're missing, we're missing the point if we just make sort of categorical recommendations like that. When a person is constipated, if it's mild constipation, they increase their fiber, they go for a walk after dinner, they drink some water, and they will start to poop. And once the bowels start moving and they're pooping, fiber is your friend. It is fantastic for maintaining bowel rhythm, for keeping things moving through. The problem is when you are locked up and you pour more fiber in there, you are pouring gasoline on the fire. You got to get things moving first. So in a person who is very constipated, my focus, because these people who have come to see me are not mild constipation, they wouldn't be there if they had mild constipation, they'd already be better. If you have moderate or severe constipation, 
if you find that increasing your fiber actually makes your bloating worse, take a step back. I'm not saying reduce your fiber intake. I'm saying keep it exactly where it is now and focus on getting the bowels moving. And once you get the bowels moving, now is the time to start to slowly, gently increase your fiber intake. And that would be with something you prescribe for a short period of time. Because the woman that we, Deborah, who Dotsie asked uh, her question, she, she says she can't go to the bathroom without the laxative, without the Linzess. Um, and you're saying we would just, you would just use that for a short period of time and then change the lifestyle. Um, it's hard for me to sweep. Like, I, I don't know her. I don't know Deborah. And so there's, you know, thousands of permutations of possibilities here. That being said, the vast majority of the time, I do not have to treat with lens S. The vast majority of the time, treatment with something like magnesium, which by the way, most of us are magnesium deficient, regardless of whether we're eating a vegan diet or not. Something like a magnesium supplement gets the job done for the vast majority of people. If a person is not pooping, despite the magnesium, then they're, and by the way, I just want to say for the listeners who are like kind of jotting notes here and thinking for themselves, this is not medical advice. Please talk to your doctor about this. Like you can't, you can't just listen to a podcast and no. take on complex nuanced, nuanced health topics. But if the magnesium is not getting the job done, if a person requires lens S, then the question is sitting out there, does this person have pelvic dysinertia? And we need to answer that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, last quick question uh, that I, I get asked all the time uh, it, in athletes with their digestive system. H how long does it take for plants to go through uh, small and large intestines as opposed to meat? And, and can people figure that out for, for themselves? Uh, but, but yeah. So I don't, so, okay, I can answer the question. I don't know how you would actually test how long the meat takes because it's a little bit hard to tag the meat in a way where you would know when it comes out. Okay. Whereas with plants, there's ways, there's ways that we can tag your motility and identify when the plants are coming through. Um, so, but that being said, what we do know is this, that first of all, typical, there's, we all have an individualized bowel pattern of how often we go and how long it takes for our gut to mobilize things through. And believe it or not, some of our research at Zoe, this company that I am the US medical director for, we're very involved in clinical research. We've published more than 40 papers. One of them shows us that if you identify how long it takes for a person to have their bowels run through, you actually are providing insight into what's happening with their microbiome. Mm -hmm. Many of us are 24 hours. Many of us are 36 hours. We can be on an entire spectrum, though, of less than that or more than that. Okay. Um, fat slows down motility. There is zero fiber in animal products. You give me a thousand pounds of it. There's zero grams of fiber in there. Mm -hmm. When you pour the fat in and there does not, it does not include fiber, you should expect your bowels to be pumping the brakes hard. Flip side, the avocado. Avocado is actually a very rich source of fiber. Yes, it does contain fat, healthy fat. And when you consume an avocado, it's going to help you poop because mm -hmm. the fiber is helping to balance out against the fat and keep things moving through. And how can you, how can you tag, like you mentioned, for vegetables, even if you can't tag it for meat? You could eat beets. You could eat a can of corn. Here's the only issue with those two approaches. They're natural. That's great. You know, I love natural. The, the problem with that approach is it's not actually validated by scientific studies. It, it works, but we can't um, assume that what you find there is the same as what you would find in ones that are scientifically validated. Oh, okay. With Zoe, we validated a study where people ate a blue muffin. It doesn't have to be a muffin, but the blue food dye, which I know people freak out but I just want to say like, there's actually no studies that say that blue food dye is specifically causing harm to the body and you're doing it one time. Um, but the blue, the, in this study, people ate muffins with blue food dye. And by doing that, we actually validated this intervention where you could do this at home, eat something blue with the appropriate amount of food dye 
and see when it shows up in your poo, your poo turns blue. Mm. And then, you know, you could basically stop the clock at that moment. Great. Oh, I'll stick with the beats. The beats is like, you're like, there they are. And the pee and the poo. Exactly. So Dr. B, how can people find you and order your book and keep up with what you're up to? So you can, you can find me um, at my website, theplantfedgut.com. I have a newsletter, email newsletter that I'm very proud of. Uh, when there's breaking news studies, I will share them there. Um, you can find me on social media as the Gut Health MD, both, both in Instagram and Facebook. And you know, finally, my books, first was Fiber Fueled, now it's the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. Um, you can find this where, these books wherever books are sold. Uh, you know, like you could you could buy from Amazon if you want to. My thing is this: that we're coming out of a pandemic. Most likely in your community, there is a local mom and pop bookshop that, frankly, has struggled the last two years. If I have a choice where to hand my dollars, I choose to hand them to my neighbor so that it can enrich their life, as opposed to the person who's also who's already mega rich owning Amazon. <laughs> Thanks That's for that tip. Advice. All right, yeah. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Good luck with it. I, well, I've got a couple copies here because me and mom, we're, we're going to definitely, I don't know if she's yeah. going to be diving in. Thanks for all yeah. your guidance and, and help. And, and it, I, we do, I feel more empowered and, and inspired to, to, to make changes, but to just, uh, for so many people that are suffering, that are listening yeah. to this in different ways, like we, yeah, we got some keys to unlock. Thank you. I, I, I just feel like these people who are suffering many times they lose hope. It's like situations yeah. like you described in the healthcare system that make you feel like you're just completely disempowered and there's no way forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm here to, to basically fight back against that and let you know that like you can be healed. It is going to happen. It is quite simply just a matter of when, as long as you're willing to be persistent and never give up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, as it as it is with most things, right? When you really have a goal. All about the persistence. Yeah. So, all right, thank you guys. Hey Goodbye. folks. Okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long does not need to be a whole story, just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review. And zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>